The prayer that uh, Joyce just led us in today is a one of corporate confession, one of individual confession. In what way do you and I need to repent? In what way do we need to assess our condition? And in what way do we need to center our hearts afresh on Jesus Christ? Today, we consider our Lord's final message to the seven churches of Asia Minor, where he asks the church at Laodicea those questions. Listen closely to the word of our Lord in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus plainly issues a call to repentance. The city of Laodicea was a professional prestigious and prosperous community. Yet in spite of all of its prominence, the city had poor water quality. Uh, the hot mineral springs of Heropolis, with their healing benefits, were only a few miles north of Laodicea. And then to the east of Laodicea, in the city of Colossae, that an individual could drink cold, refreshing water. But hot and cold water being viewed positively, because each having their beneficial qualities, Laodicea had neither. It relied on accessing water through an aqueduct system from a mountain-fed spring several miles south. And by the time that water reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm. A practical, albeit imperfect, Analogy is to picture how some people might enjoy their hot cup of coffee, I don't know why, um, and that others might enjoy their cold glass of lemonade, but whether you like coffee or lemonade, tepid is not the flavor you're looking for. Maybe you need a warm up, maybe you need some more ice in the glass. Quite notably, Jesus is once again drawing from the setting of the city to provide a commentary on the church that was located within it. Verse 17 indicates that the church in Laodicea had much in the way of wealth and comfort, but like the city's drinking water, the Laodiceans' faith and witness did not have a healthy effect on the people who lived around them. This is what it means to say that the church was lukewarm. Jesus is saying, I wish that you were useful. I wish that you were beneficial and productive in some way, not a mediocre, half-hearted, in-between status. This is not to suggest, mind you, that the church in Laodicea was in any way lazy. It's just the opposite, in fact. Laodicea had been destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60. And the Romans then came to them and asked what help they required from Rome. But Laodicea was having none of it. 
They said, we can do it on our own. We are rich enough to take care of ourselves. It was such a spirit of self-sufficiency that defined the city, and it was such a spirit of self-sufficiency that came to define the church. In their self-sufficiency, those within the church had become distracted with busyness, with the things of this world, with getting ahead in this life. Amid this self-sufficiency, they had become accustomed to leisure, to pleasure, to entertainment. Even today, you can find in the ruins of Laodicea, their large amphitheaters. What they had come to lack, however, was an awareness of their utter dependency upon Jesus. What they had come to lack was a mindfulness for the things of God. Now, we are tempted. We're tempted here to think that the Laodicean congregation consisted uh, solely of unbelievers, but verse 19 begins, those whom I love, I reprove, and I discipline. This then is not merely an evangelistic message to unbelievers, it's also a communication to the church to repent over what it was that it had come to lack. Might we identify in some way with the church of Laodicea today? In what ways have we become self-sufficient? In what ways have we become self-seeking? In what ways have we become spiritually apathetic? How often do we go about our day without giving it to Jesus? I can manage my life just fine, we say. I can handle the ebbs and the flows of the day, but how often it just leaves me too busy to open the scriptures. It, it leaves me too busy to pray. And I'm so busy and I'm so distracted because, well, I want to make sure that I have the nicest things and that I enjoy the newest trends. I mean, do you have the I-15 or 24 or whatever it is now? My phone? I, for one, need to repent of my spirit of self-sufficient busyness. Even the things that we do in the name of Jesus might emerge from a sense of our own strength. So maybe, just maybe, we need to consider surrendering our ministries if they begin to distract us from the Lord rather than draw us closer to him. Our Savior deserves our full devotion. In whatever way he's not getting that, you and I need to repent. It means we need to assess our condition. It means that we need to center our focus back on Jesus. How might Jesus have us assess our condition? As to Laodicea, its wealth and comfort led them to simply go through the motions in their worship of Jesus. They claimed Christ without really clinging to Christ, making this church the only one of the seven churches in Asia Minor that Jesus offers no word of affirmation. In addressing this affluent church, Jesus ironically calls it poor, blind, and naked. We can fully track this progression in verse 18. Laodicea had placed its confidence in a banking system along with its financial security. Only Jesus says that they must combat their spiritual poverty by buying from him gold refined by fire. And gold tried by fire is symbolic of the strength of faith in Jesus that stands even amid the crucibles of this life. The Apostle Peter tells the church in 1 Peter 1 verse 7 to let the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Church, we need to remain zealous and passionate for Christ. Not just seeking some easy, comfortable life. Laodicea had placed its confidence in a clothing manufacturing industry and its textile trade. You see, the region had a valuable wool found only in its valleys that was soft in texture and black in color. And as a result, the Laodiceans almost exclusively wore black garments. It was a way to show off their wealth, their prosperity. And clothing does often reveal status in society, does it not? I mean, an Armani suit versus a suit one wears from Kohl's. You see a difference. You know the cost is different. Uh, only the Lord does not look on the outside. He looks on the heart. Jesus says they must combat their spiritual nakedness by clothing themselves in the purity of the garments that he alone provides. Most of all, Laodicea placed its confidence in eye care advancements and treatments. They produced in their city a particular eye salve called Clarurium. It came from a famous Phrygian stone in order to treat eye illnesses. Only Jesus says they must combat their spiritual blindness by applying the eye salve that he supplies. See, we must become spiritually discerning. We must become receptive to God's word over every area of our lives. Only how dangerously close perhaps we as the church in America fit the description of Laodicea. Does the concern of what we have, our finances, our banking, how we look, our clothing, and the way we feel, our workout routine, our health and witness, does it take precedence in any way over our usefulness for Jesus? Have we somehow become lukewarm? Have we somehow begun to slip into a complacency without even noticing it? We just go through the motions. It's just convenient. It's just what we do. But it's not who we are. Mind you, this communication is not an indictment on wealth or wellness. Because part of God's blessing on Israel involved this prosperity. But it definitely intends, no matter what our circumstance and situation might be in life, no matter what we have or do not have, it definitely intends for us to say, am I useful for the kingdom of God? Am I useful for my king, Jesus? Compare for a moment a bouquet of roses beside a potted plant. The bouquet of roses might look more beautiful. It might be more pleasing to the eye, but it's going to wither and it's going to die. The potted plant it's more plain, it's more pedestrian, if you will, but if properly rooted, it will live on. Would you not say it's better to be a potted, rooted plant than a withered bouquet? Rootedness in Christ never translates to a useless, self-sufficient, halfway commitment like what Francis Chan reveals in his children's book, Halfway Herbert. I, I'm going to read a few pages from it near the end. I commend the entire book to you, whether you have children, grandchildren, or not. Jesus doesn't want us to love him halfway. God doesn't want us to live out just half of our hearts. He tells us this in the Bible. This is his dad talking to halfway Herbert. 
Jesus told his friends about a man who was planning to build a tower. Before he started, he made sure he had enough money to build it. He made sure the tower was strong and would stand for a long time. He didn't want to be teased for his work, and he wanted others to know he was a hard worker. This man didn't just try halfway with his tower, and we shouldn't follow Jesus halfway either. He deserves our whole hearts, our total devotion. But I've never been able to do things all the way, cried Herbert. God knows that none of us can love him all the way by ourselves. So he gave us a friend called the Holy Spirit to help us live out of our whole hearts, Herbert's dad said. When we decide to follow Jesus all the way, God's Spirit fills up our hearts and helps us obey God. Can God's Spirit help me? Herbert asked. Yes, his dad answered. God loves when we ask for his help. So Herbert prayed. Jesus, I am sorry I haven't obeyed you. I want to follow you, but I don't want to follow you halfway. I need your help. Please give me your spirit so I can know how to follow you. It's a good prayer, isn't it? We must open our hearts to Christ. We must Respond to his voice. How is the Holy Spirit calling you and me to repent today? What is he revealing to us about the condition of our lives? More than anything, I will say it more than anything, what we need is the Holy Spirit to bring us either to genuine faith or to revive our faith again so that we center our focus on Christ. In the movie City Slickers, Billy Crystal plays Mitch Robbins. He's a man going through a midlife crisis. He feels great dissatisfaction in his job, and so he starts lacking a sense of joy in his life overall. So as a birthday present, his two best friends decide to take him out west on a cattle drive. It's led by a cowboy named Curly. Only Curly dies of a heart attack before the drive was finished. Uh, the three city slickers were in no means prepared or equipped for the task, but they determined that they were going to carry the cow drive to its end. A series of challenging events ensue, and those events culminate when Mitch almost drowns. He's saving a calf that he named Norman. It's at this point that he arrives at something of an epiphany. The one thing that mattered most in Mitch's life was his family. So instead of wallowing in his self-pity over his vocational dissatisfaction, Mitch determines that he's going to do his job better. He determines he's going to be a better husband, a better father, a better friend. So the, the movie's coming to an end, and Mitch tells one of his best friends how Curly earlier shared with him the secret of life. That was it. Now, the movie is somewhat relativistic. Mitch Robbins says, you've got to find the one thing for yourself. What's your one thing? Our one thing is the same. The one thing that we all need is Jesus. The one thing we need to focus our hearts and our minds on is Jesus. Don't you remember the account in Mark 10, 17 to 27? It's the account of the rich young ruler. What was the one thing he lacked? Surrendering everything to Jesus. I don't want you to lack the one thing. The one thing you need is Jesus. 
It all boils down, doesn't it, to what throne we perceive to hold the greatest worth. Is it a throne here and now? Or is it a throne yet to come? In verse 14, the description of Jesus is as the amen, as the faithful and true witness who will usher in the final word of our history. And according to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 20 and 21, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Father's promises. He is the yes and the amen. He is the fulfillment of history. And he is the one who renews. He is the one who forgives. He is the one by his atoning death and victorious resurrection who has become the ruler of God's creation and who should be the ruler of our hearts. So... Let's make sure that Jesus always is and Jesus always remains our one thing. And no matter where we find ourselves today, thankfully, thankfully, Christ never gives up on us. He never gives up on you. He never gives up on me. He never gives up on anyone. The tense for the verbs stand and knock in verse 20, that points to a present continuous action on the part of Jesus. So, you know, we talk about the seven churches of Asia Minor and we look at the word to Laodicea what happened to the Laodiceans? What happened to the church in Laodicea? Here's the thing. Church history records that the church in Laodicea actually remained dynamic after many churches in Asia disappeared. One of the churches Bishops in Laodicea was martyred for his faith in AD 161, sometime clearly after John had written the Revelation. Furthermore, in AD 364, Laodicea was the location chosen for a significant church council. So it appears that the church in Laodicea learned this lesson and that God continued to bless the Christian community there for some time afterwards. What will happen to us as a church? What will happen to the church in America? More pointedly, what will happen to you as a believer in Jesus Christ. And Jesus stands and he knocks at the doors of our heart. How do we need to repent today? In what way does our life need to start looking different than what it looks right now? This message is not just for unbelievers, church. It's for us. It's a beautiful song that we're about to sing. We'll come to the altar. Maybe you need to come to the altar today. Maybe you need to just kneel and repent. Or maybe you just need to do that right where you are.
But if Christ is knocking, if the Holy Spirit is speaking, do not resist. Let's stand. Let's sing.